Hi everyone and welcome to our module on surgical instruments. You're going to see a lot of different surgical instruments used on your surgery rotation and you should know that each of them is designed to fulfill a specific purpose and make a task in the operating room more effective or efficient. Some instruments are better for cutting and dissecting tissues while others are better for grasping and holding them. We want to make sure that we can see what we're doing so we'll often use certain retractors in order to move other tissues out of the way. Oftentimes in surgery we have to remove a piece of diseased organ and put the remaining organ back together like you would if you were taking out a piece of the intestine and in that case we use instruments to help bring these tissues together. And finally, in surgery, we like to be able to prevent and control blood loss, so there are instruments we use to help us. The scalpel is often the first instrument you see used in the operating room because it's used to make the skin incision. There are a couple of different scalpel blades to be familiar with that differ mostly on their blade geometry. The 15 blade has a short, curved blade, and so it's helpful for making precise and curved incisions. The number 11 blade looks more like a sharp knife, and so it's often used to make stab incisions, like you would for an abscess drainage. The number 10 blade definitely has the largest belly blade of all three knives, and so it's helpful for making large, straight incisions, like you would for an abdominal surgery, like an exploratory laparotomy. The way you hold a scalpel depends on what type of scalpel you're trying to hold. Since you use an 11 and a 15 blade to make focused, precise incisions, you get more control when you hold it like you would a pencil. On the other hand, since a 10 blade is often used to make long, straight incisions and you can be broad in your knife strokes, it's tended to be held like you would a violin bow, with your middle finger and thumb supporting the shaft of the instrument and your index finger to stabilize the blade. Scissors are commonly used in the operating room, and the Mayo scissors, like the ones you see on the screen here, are used to cut through heavy tissues as well as cut sutures. That's why they're also known as suture scissors. Pot scissors are often used in vascular surgery to make cuts in blood vessels, and the angled nature of the blades allow you to do that better. Mets and bomb scissors have a longer handle to blade ratio, and so they're often used for fine dissection and difficult to reach areas in order to help expose delicate tissues. Surgical scissors are held differently from how you would hold household scissors. For these instruments, you want to put your thumb and ring finger within the finger holes of the instrument, and then stabilize your ring finger with your middle finger on one side, and support the blade using your index finger. You'll probably find that this feels the most ergonomic to hold and is especially useful when you're pronating and supinating your hand to be the most efficient with your movements. You'll see in surgery that it's actually pretty difficult to hold on to tissues using just your hands and fingers. And so we rely on instruments known as forceps to help us pick tissues up. There are a number of different types of forceps, but they can be categorized according to how you hold them. Some forceps are best held like you would a pencil, and this is ergonomic for stabilizing tissues and needles. An example of a pencil grip forcep is the DeBakey forcep that you can see on the right here. The other type of forcep is the thumb ring finger grip forcep, and this is held just like you would a pair of surgical scissors. These forceps tend to have locking mechanisms with different amounts of tissue tension that you can exert. So if you're trying to exert high tissue tension and move tissues out of the way, you might clamp down on the instrument. Otherwise, you want to be more delicate when you're trying to grasp bowel and occlude blood vessels. But these instruments can also be used for fine dissection and securing drapes and sutures or ties. An example of a thumb ring finger forcep is the Alice or the tonsil schnitt. Many of the forceps I mentioned can be used to push and pull tissues out of the way so that we can see what we're doing in surgery. But you should know that there are a number of instruments dedicated solely to the task of retraction. They come in many different shapes and sizes, and this ultimately determines whether they're used for superficial wounds or deep wounds. Some of these retractors are handheld, like the Army Navy you see on the right, while others are table mounted, like the Bookwalter retractor that attaches to the operating room table. Some retractors are also self retaining, like the Wheatlander retractor that opens up within a superficial space and stays open. Tissues aren't the only thing that can get in our way when we're trying to see what we're doing in surgery, and this is where suction comes in. There are a variety of different suction tips like the yank hour or pool suction, and they're all connected by a piece of tubing to an external suction source, and ultimately that's used to evacuate fluid that can accumulate in the operative field like blood or smoke that emanates from our electrosurgical equipment when it's used to heat up tissues to the point of coagulation. When it comes to tissues that are designed for tissue unification, you have to talk about needle drivers, 
whose obvious job is to hold and push suturing needles that are used to bring tissues together. All of these needle drivers have some sort of textured jaws and ratchet mechanism to grab onto a needle and hold onto it until it's necessary to let go. The most common needle driver you'll see used is the Mayo Hagar needle driver, and there are many variations of it based on its size and shape. The less common type of needle driver you'll see used is the Castrovejo, as you see on the right here. And this has a very simplistic mechanism that allows you to hold on to needles very nimbly. And these are typically used for vascular anastomoses and vascular surgery. The Mayo Hager needle drivers are held just like you would a thumb ring finger forcep or a scissor, with your thumb and your ring finger in the holes of the instrument, and then using your index finger and middle finger to support it. The Castroveo needle driver is held more like you would a pair of chopsticks, with your index finger and thumb to support the edges of the instrument, and squeezing down to clasp and unclasp the mouth. Sometimes the tissues we're tasked with unifying are part of hollow organs like the intestine, stomach, or the lung. And these hollow organs allow intestinal content or respiratory secretions to pass through. Now these secretions aren't benign. Obviously at the end of the day, what's carried in the bowel and the stomach is poop. And so when we're connecting these tissues together, we want to make sure that the connection is airtight and that there's no leak. Now you can't go wrong using something like a needle driver and suture to bring these types of tissues together. But sometimes if it's safe to do so, it's more ergonomic and even more efficient to use something like a cutter or a stapler. Now these instruments are all referred to as staplers, but they work in slightly different mechanisms of action. The linear cutter, for example, fires two rows of staples and then cuts and divides a tissue in between those two rows. The linear stapler, on the other hand, doesn't cut and it instead just fires two rows of staples. The surgeon can then make a cut using a knife or a scissor in order to divide the tissue from the stapler. And finally, you have the circular cutter, which is often used to bring together intestines that lie deep in the pelvis that are typically out of reach. And in this case, it fires two rows of circular staples and then cuts and divides the tissue on the inside of those two staple lines in order to have reinforcement to prevent leaks. Sometimes you have to remove a piece of diseased intestine and then bring those two pieces of intestine back together in order to restore gastrointestinal continuity and allow contents to keep flowing. In this case, you might use something like a functional end-to-end -end anastomosis. The best way to think about this is to think about the loops of intestine that you're bringing together like you're staring down the barrel of a shotgun. Each arm of the stapler is brought into one of the loops. The stapler is then closed the two rows of staples are fired, and the cutter cuts a line in between them. That way, when you flip the diagram to the side, you have a pathway for intestinal contents to flow. But in this case, the opening of the shotgun barrel is still there. So then you can use a linear stapler in order to fire two rows of staples, and then a scalpel in order to cut the remaining tissue emanating from the stapler. At the end of the day, you have a pathway for intestinal contents to flow around the point of connection. Another way you can think about this is to consider a pair of scrub pants. After the linear cutter is used to fire two rows of staples and then cut in between, the connection looks like a pair of scrub pants would from the inside for things to move from one pant leg to the other. The final step is the linear cutter being used to seal off the waistband. Then after those two rows of staples are fired, you can then use the scalpel to cut the excess tissue off. Another technique used to restore intestinal continuity is the end-to-end -end anastomosis. You'll see this being done in procedures that involve a connection being created low in the pelvis. That's difficult to reach ergonomically using some of the other instruments we talked about. In this case, a proximal loop of intestine is cinched around a free anvil that carries the stapler load. A distal portion of the intestine is sealed off using something like a linear stapler. A circular cutter is then advanced through the anus and allowed to be positioned right before the tissue. Then a needle is advanced through the circular cutter and combines with the free anvil. The two stapler loads are fired and then a cut is made on the inside portion of the second staple line. That allows intestinal contents to flow through that new connection. This video was taken with a colonoscope in order to evaluate a colorectal anastomosis 
created with a circular stapler. And you can see this white line of tissue here represents the circular staple line. Electrosurgical instruments are commonly used in modern surgery to assist us with dissection and stopping small blood vessels from bleeding. These instruments work by exerting localized tissue burning and damage, and there are a number of misconceptions regarding how they actually work. For example, the terms cautery and electrosurgery are often interchangeably used, but this is wrong because they have different mechanisms of action. Another term that's often thrown around is the difference between monopolar and bipolar. All electrosurgical instruments are bipolar in nature. The electrical current that's generated using the device passes from one pole to the other. However, in typical monopolar instruments like the Bovi, there's one pole that's actually exerting localized tissue damage, and then the remaining current travels through a pad that's connected to the patient back to the machine. In bipolar instruments like the ligature, the energy generated is confined to the tissues between the two electrodes, and there is no pad located on the patient. In this case, there's no return electrode needed, and so it's often preferred in patients with life-sustaining devices because there's no random current being spread throughout the body before it returns to a pad. As we move on to instruments that are used primarily for laparoscopic or minimally invasive abdominal surgery, it's important to talk about those that help us access the abdomen safely. Each of these tools advances through the layers of the abdominal wall. For example, the varus needle that you can see on the right here is a spring-loaded needle that goes through each layer of the abdomen one by one. Once it's inside the peritoneal cavity, you can connect some tubing that's connected to a CO2 source in order to establish pneumoperitoneum that you need for laparoscopic surgery. Once you have pneumoperitoneum, you can insert trocars through small puncture-like incisions in the abdomen. These ultimately act as portals for your laparoscopic instruments to go through the body and enter the peritoneal cavity. Some commonly used laparoscopic instruments are illustrated on the slide here. For example, a Kittner is a cotton-tipped applicator that's typically used for blunt dissection. The Maryland dissector is curved and has a fine point that's helpful for precise grasping and fine dissection as well. The Hunter grasper has atraumatic teeth, and so it's often used to pick up a variety of tissues in laparoscopic surgery. Another laparoscopic instrument you might see used is the ultrasonic scalpel, and its purpose is similar to some of our electrosurgical equipment in that it's used to help coagulate blood vessels and assist with dissection. But instead of using electricity to generate heat, it relies on high-frequency mechanical energy to generate the heat needed to help bring damage to tissues. In doing so, it actually exerts less thermal spread. And just like there are staplers used for open surgery, there are endo staplers used for laparoscopic surgery. These staplers fire two rows of staples and then cut and divide the tissue in between the staple rows. And that concludes our module on surgical instruments.